Yeah, SpaceX can land super heavy on the launch tower pretty easily now, but it's still far from perfect. What if the tower has a problem? With nowhere to land, the booster would have to splash down in the ocean, and that's a big problem. It slows down recovery, disrupts the launch cadence, and could even damage internal components. That's exactly why SpaceX is pushing hard to make sure this 33-engine beast can touch down safely on a drone ship, just like Falcon 9. So, what bold moves have they made to make that happen? Let's dive into today's episode of Alpha Tech. The end of this year marks a golden time for SpaceX. We're about to witness a massive leap, not just in infrastructure, with Launchpad 2 nearing completion at Starbase, a brand new pad rising at LC-39A in Florida, and two massive Starship Gigabays, but also in the transition to the upgraded Starship Block 3. And with this new version, our focus now turns to its booster, Super Heavy Block 3, which is part of a bold new plan, developing a backup landing method. Instead of relying entirely on Mechazilla, SpaceX is working on making it land safely, on a drone ship. Even though SpaceX hasn't said much about this publicly, Starship's ninth test flight gives us some big clues. On May 27, 2025, Booster 14 was assigned a risky mission to land in the Gulf at a steep angle of attack. This wasn't just about proving reusability. It was a carefully designed experiment to see how Super Heavy performs under more extreme aerodynamic conditions. By tilting the booster at a sharper angle, SpaceX was testing how air resistance could help slow it down, saving precious fuel for a future landing on a drone ship. So, why does this matter? When the booster reaches about 1,000 meters above the drone ship, it's still falling fast, roughly 100 meters per second, or 360 kilometers per hour. At that point, SpaceX reignites three Raptor engines, then quickly drops to two to perform the final landing burn. Each engine consumes between 300 and 500 liters of methalox per second, meaning they burn through around 9,000 to 15,000 liters in just 10 to 15 seconds. The thrust must be finely controlled, anywhere from 50 to 100 percent of each engine's maximum 2,250 kilonewtons to reduce the booster's speed to near zero, right as it touches down. And it has to do all this while aiming for a tiny 50 by 50 meter drone ship, floating in the ocean. That's why the high angle of attack during re-entry is so important. It helps slow the booster down using aerodynamic drag, while also keeping it stable, saving precious fuel for landing. Of course, SpaceX only attempts this when the ocean is calm. If the sea is rough, they'll fall back on Mechazilla. But on Flight 9, SpaceX pushed the envelope even further. Not only did they use the high-angle re-entry profile, they also deliberately disabled one of the three center engines during the landing burn, fired up an outer ring engine instead, and then switched back to just two center Raptors. It was a planned simulation of an engine-out scenario, a test to see if Super Heavy could survive unexpected failures during a drone ship landing, where every second and every engine counts. Unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. Just a few seconds into the landing burn, contact with the booster was lost. About six minutes after launch, it experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly, abruptly ending the first ever reflight of a Super Heavy booster. As it turns out, that steep angle of attack while useful for slowing down, may have also been its downfall. It disrupted the flow of propellant to the Raptor engines during the burn, starving them mid-flight. And with fuel cut off at the worst possible moment, the booster never had a chance to stick the landing. To address this issue, SpaceX quickly rolled out a new update for the Super Block 3. It not only fixed the propellant flow interruption, but also made drone ship landings more stable overall. And that update? It involved a major redesign of the internal structure of the Super Heavy booster. One of the biggest changes was to the fuel tank architecture, because they were adding something called the fuel transfer tube. You can actually see it during integration, a massive pipe being lifted and inserted straight into the booster. It spans nearly a third of the booster's diameter, almost three meters across. SpaceX welded together multiple segments to create a tube about 20 to 25 meters long. But what exactly is this thing? It's less like a pipe and more like a secondary fuel tank. It has to be incredibly strong because it's under enormous load, and a single leak would be game over. Simply put, this giant internal tube acts as a high-pressure fuel reservoir. It's designed to take in the ultra-cold propellants, 
liquid oxygen, and liquid methane from the main tanks of Super Heavy, and then evenly distribute that fuel to all 33 Raptor engines. Its main job? To support rapid flip maneuvers during landing by ensuring steady propellant flow even while the rocket is tumbling. It also allows for simultaneous engine ignition during launch and landing burns, boosting both performance and reliability. During a flip, the booster can experience 1 to 2 Gs of acceleration within seconds. That's enough to slam the remaining 500,000 to 900,000 kilograms of fuel hard against the tank walls, like shaking up a bottle of water. That sloshing creates huge inertia, making drone landings extremely risky. This violent motion can force propellant away from intake points, disrupt flow, and drop pressure. And with each Raptor engine demanding around 7,000 kilograms of fuel per second, even a brief pressure dip, say, from 300 bar down to below 200, could mean ignition failure. That's where the redesigned tube comes in. It draws fuel from the main tanks, regulates internal pressure, and sends it through smaller lines to each engine, keeping everything stable even under extreme conditions. Since it handles both LOX and methane, this tube's gotta be insulated. Otherwise, heat sneaks in, and that's bad news for cryogenic propellants. So, yeah, it's not just some metal pipe shoved inside the booster. It's basically the fuel command center, a critical upgrade that makes landing a super heavy not just possible, but smoother, safer, and one step closer to becoming. Now, honestly, this is a landing method worth trying, and SpaceX knows it. Chances are, they'll go for another high-angle approach with Booster 16 and Starship Flight 10, just to gather more data and see if they can make it work. Because if they can pull it off, the benefits could be huge. Right now, if the booster can't land on a drone ship, it has to splash down in the ocean instead. That doesn't line up with SpaceX's goal of fast, efficient rocket reuse. They need to send a massive ship out just to bring it back. And worse, salt water gets everywhere, seeping into the hardware, corroding the internals, and turning everything into a maintenance nightmare. That's why SpaceX seems to be moving toward a much better option, landing on a drone ship. It's a method they've already perfected with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, and for good reason. First off, it's safer. Landing at sea keeps the risk away from people and infrastructure. The ocean absorbs the heat, force, sound, and vibrations. Basically, all the messy stuff. In fact, SpaceX has already faced lawsuits over noise pollution and environmental impact from rocket launches at their Starbase facility in Boca Chica, Texas. Environmental groups like the Center for Biological Diversity and the American Bird Conservancy sued the FAA in May 2023, accusing them of failing to conduct a proper environmental review before approving Starship launches. The concern? Serious harm to the habitats of protected wildlife like migratory birds, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, and ocelots. That's also why 88% of Falcon 9 landings happen on drone ships. Second, drone ships are incredibly flexible. They can be positioned anywhere along Starship's flight path to optimize the trajectory, shorten the return distance, and save a ton of fuel. This mobility lets SpaceX adjust the landing location for each mission, support more complex orbits, boost launch frequency, and get the most bang for their buck. Third, the ocean gives SpaceX a vast playground. They can land Starship pretty much anywhere at sea, wherever the mission needs. That flexibility supports complex flight paths, avoids collision risks, optimizes the return trajectory, and ensures safety, all without being tied to fixed land-based infrastructure. But of course, it's not all smooth sailing. The biggest challenge? Recovery time. See, even though drone ships can be stationed far out at sea, bringing them back with a starship on deck could take days. That naturally slows down the refurbishment cycle compared to a quick return to land. SpaceX knows this, and they're already thinking ahead. One clever solution, mentioned in FAA documents, is something called horizontal delivery. Once Starship lands and is secured, a special mechanism would gently tip the vehicle from vertical to horizontal. That way, it's easier to transport, puts less stress on the structure, and protects it better from rough waves or high winds. Then there's the hardware challenge. You can't exactly bolt a Mechazilla tower onto a floating barge, at least not yet. So, for sea-based missions, Starship may need to bring back some kind of deployable landing legs. Yeah, it complicates the design, but it could be a smart trade-off, especially for future Moon or Mars landings, 
where there's no fancy tower waiting to catch the ship. Landing legs are going to be essential anyway, especially in the early exploration phase, when ground infrastructure is minimal. So, why not start testing that system now, out at sea, where conditions are tough and the data is invaluable. And finally, there's the platform itself. Falcon 9 lands on a barge, Starship needs a fortress. To handle something that big and that heavy, SpaceX will need a whole new kind of drone ship, probably around 100 by 50 meters. It'll need a reinforced landing pad, ultra-precise positioning, and a giant crane to secure and support both Super Heavy and Starship, together weighing nearly 200 tons after landing. It's a massive challenge, but a necessary one, because if SpaceX wants Starship to fly, often, to land anywhere, and to come back safely, then mastering ocean landings is a big part of the puzzle. Actually, the idea of landing Starship on a drone ship isn't new. It's been around for nearly five years. Back in 2020, SpaceX bought two old oil rigs from a company called Valeris, with plans to turn them into floating landing platforms for Starship. Elon Musk named them Phobos and Deimos, after the two moons of Mars. No surprise there, he's obsessed with the red planet. Each rig measured around 78 meters long and 73 meters wide, with four massive corner columns, about 15 meters tall and 14 meters wide. They were being modified to support landings of the massive Super Heavy booster. The idea was to use these offshore rigs as floating landing pads, keeping high-risk landings away from populated areas, while taking advantage of the wide-open ocean. The retrofitting work involved strengthening the platform, adding precision navigation systems, and even installing water-cooled sound suppression, just like ground-based launch pads. But the plan was scrapped around 2022. The rigs were never fully converted, and the project was eventually dropped. Instead, SpaceX pivoted to the Mechazilla system, that giant launch tower with robotic arms designed to catch Super Heavy right on the launch mount. It turned out to be cheaper, simpler, and way more efficient for rapid reusability. At the FAA Commercial Space Transportation Conference on February 8, 2023, SpaceX COO Gwyn Shotwell confirmed the rigs were sold, saying they just weren't the right platform. And, maybe, now is the right time to revisit that idea. 2025 is already a packed year for SpaceX, but if everything goes well, maybe next year, we'll finally witness Starship landing on a drone ship for the first time. Something to truly look forward to.